This is a very different episode of Story Surgery. As much as it will be an examination of the narrative scene within a video game, the subject matter we're going to be talking about today is going to be heavy. Discussions of story structure, the inner workings of the psyche, and how it all culminates to a story about someone who's trying to be something that they're not, by clinging onto the hope for themselves and for those who have been consumed by self-doubt. I will inform you when the video shifts into spoiler territory, in terms of how the story unfolds beyond what is seen from Chapter 3 onwards. This episode will be a discussion about stories that focus on or involve the interweaving threads of mental health, and how this one, in particular, managed to highlight on the many different aspects that are both approachable to many, but relatable to even more. Let's begin. It can be a very scary thing to tackle subject matter in your own stories that most people would find taboo of some regard. Perhaps you're talking about something personal to you, and therefore you want to make sure that it comes out in the story that you're trying to conceive. Or perhaps you want to tackle something that you don't feel is covered as much as it possibly could be in other mediums. Whatever your reason is for wanting to make that story and touching upon the subject matter that you wish to, there's always going to be that little bit of resistance that comes from the feedback and critiques of those around you. But the type of critique that plagues creatives all throughout history, regardless of stature, intent, skill set, and execution of what they will do with their creativity, is buried deep within the folds of the subconscious. Something deeply rooted that manages to crawl its way to the surface of your mind, and twist things that make you question everything you've done, are doing, and will do. And sometimes the simple act of putting color to a page is enough to spark hope for a masterpiece and torment those who believe that what they are doing will never amount to anything. The year was 2018. An American-Canadian indie game developer, Greg Lobanov, had released his game Wandersong to critical success and was ready to begin work on the next project. Lobanov had been working in the realms of game development for some time now, stemming all the way back to 2008 on the Game Maker forums, where he would share his freeware games that he made in his free time. To this day, Greg's portfolio has grown substantially and spans a wide array of genres and titles. To the classical RPG-inspired Phantasmaburbia, the deck-building adventure game of Coin Crypt, and the previously mentioned edition that is the musical platforming adventure that is Wandersong. Something that Greg has always had a kick for was telling stories of many different flavors and ideas. And while the stories that he crafted in some of his earlier works had much more of a heavy tone, it was with Wandersong that there was a unique shift in the ideas of a fun subversion into the structures of plots for how games in this space could tell a compelling story with a unique style that matched the visual aesthetic of the game overall. And with his most recent adventures of hues and saturations, the visuals are compelling, the gameplay is inventive, and the story that is told is one of the most invasive experiences I've had in the last decade that broke me down to my core and made me realize what we have here with this game is an examination of how stories can pierce into the very hearts of those who have dedicated their lives to the love of the creative arts. And that game is Chicory, A Colorful Tale. Hmm. I want to have some fun visuals for this plot summary, but I don't have any of my drawing tools with me. Ho hold on a second, I got an idea. Hey, Ice and Luna, I'm working on the Chicory video and was wondering if you'd like to do some drawings for the v The heck was that noise? Are you working on the Chicory video? <laughs> Sup? I didn't even hit send, how did you- I saw you typing, but you took too long. Okay. Um, but how did you both get- Well, I was here to steal chips, but then I showed up and crashed through the walls. There was a door, like, right at the beginning of the studio, you know, you could have just- I have no time for doors! I'm putting my art in your video! Well, heck, I guess it's collaboration time. It's that time again, folks! Oh god, no. EBZ messaged some friends to see if they wanted to collaborate on this video, but before he could even hit send, they broke the sound barrier, busted through the walls of the studio so they could draw some stuff. Uh, who was that? Just, just ignore that. I don't know where that comes from. We really should get better security around here, man. In today's episode, it's Ice Wolf and Luna Doggy! <laughs> oh, 
a very big thank you to both Ice Wolf and Luna Doggy to join in on this fun adventure. They are also very big fans of Chicory A Colorful Tale, and when the opportunity came around, I knew that I wanted to get them involved in a collaborative process for this video. You can find out their details and information in the description down below. The plot of Chicory A Colorful Tale goes a little something like this. All of the color in the world is brought into existence from a magic paintbrush and has been handed down over the generations. The previous holder of the brush takes on an apprentice to be their successor. Eventually, the mantle is passed on and a new wielder is chosen. The current wielder, Chicory, is hailed as a remarkable artist whose style and colors have brought a wonderful sense of life to the world. And you are in charge of keeping the wielder tower clean of dust. I mean, somebody's gotta do it right. <laughs> you can't let someone as awesome as Chikorai deal with dust. <laughs> She's got important wielder stuff to worry about. But one day, whilst you're cleaning the supply closet, all of the colors just vanish, disappearing in a swirl of blackness and a soul-crushing sound. When you go to investigate, Chikorai is nowhere to be found. But the brush is located outside of Chikorai's room in the tower. And I mean, it would be wrong for you to just leave it laying there right after all. She could probably probably use the help. So, you take on the brush, and make your way around the Picnic Province, encountering all sorts of interesting characters along the way, and slowly begin to uncover the mystery of what happened to the colors, where Chicory is, and why there's this looming feeling that something from long ago and deep below is starting to bubble up to the surface. In terms of gameplay, the game follows an interesting concept that can be summed up like an elevator pitch. The Legend of Zelda meets a coloring book, foodstuffs, and psychoanalysis. It's a mouthful, but trust me, it does make sense. Stylistically, the formula of the game's narrative follows a coincidental hero structure. These are stories in which the protagonist accidentally takes or is given the title of a hero or savior that must go on a quest to help out the location by which the story revolves around. It can be a town, a city, the world, the universe even. Sometimes the protagonist likes that they've been given the role as a means to achieve self-worth or purpose. And at other times, it's constantly made aware that the protagonist really, really does not like nor think themselves as a hero. Other times, it's because the protagonist is in possession of something that makes them worthy of that title, whether internally or externally. Think born with the soul of destiny or being able to pull a sword out of a rock that no one else could. Now, it's important to know that this isn't quite the same same as the accidental hero structure, which tends to follow along the lines of someone doing something that results in them being seen as a hero. For example, someone eating a banana, then throwing the peel on the ground, and it just so happens to trip up a burglar running away from the police, which results in the Banana Man now being heralded as this larger-than-life person for doing something that really wasn't a good thing. More often than not, this tends to result in a very overused trope known as the Big Lie, where at some point in the story it gets revealed that this person is not actually a hero, but everyone really wanted them to be, but they have to find some sort of internal strength to move on and become the hero, so on and so forth. So, to reiterate, coincidental hero stories are one who the main character happens upon an item or an event that grants them the title of being heroic. Accidental heroes are the ones that did something that is misconstrued as heroic, and they are labeled as such, even though that what they did wasn't heroic at all. Notable examples of the coincidental hero structures include stories like Kung Fu Panda, where the main character was selected to be the chosen one that, for the most part, seemed like a complete accident. Harry Potter was deemed to be the one to destroy the Dark Lord, even though he defeated him once before as an infant, which even then he didn't even technically do anything because it was the result of an outside force. And the last one I'll use that probably is the most similar would be Link from The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, in that A, he's not descended from any past incarnation of the hero Link, therefore he's not bound to destiny by any means, and B, the inciting incident that kicks off his adventure is quite literally a series of horrid happenstances that results in his sister getting taken by mistake. No prophecies, no foretelling, just a really bad birthday. Seriously, move any of these events in that day by one minute, Link probably would have just stayed home. That's how close it was. I want to take a moment and dive into a little personal history about myself. In case it hasn't been made evident enough over the years, 
I am someone who lives, loves, and now works within the realms of visual communications, illustration, and graphical production. It's been this way ever since I was a kid. It was a rarity to see me without a pad of paper and a multitude of pencils and pens and other various art supplies wherever I went. On the floor, on car rides, at school, at parties, heck, even whilst in the bathroom. I was always doodling something, random things that popped into my head or crafting things that I would want to work on later on that day when I didn't have my drawing supplies with me. The moment I was given any drawing material and utensil to draw on, it was off to the races. As time went on, many different stylistic changes happened, the evolution of my own personal style, and now I work within the space of broadcast multimedia production that uses all facets of who I am. Having a game that is so deeply rooted in something that I hold very near and dear to my own personal hobbies and creative avenues is something that I appreciated deeply. Sure, there have been other games with huge expanses of the genre that have managed to perhaps scratch the itch a little bit, but nothing so much with how this game in particular manages to focus on so much of the creative avenue of illustration. I kid you not when I say that there were multiple times that I teared up when a character in this story was going on about not feeling like they were worth praise or compliments, or that they never felt like anything they were doing was going to be good enough for what they wanted to be. There was a single point in time where I actually had to get up and go a walk around the block after reading a single sentence spoken from a fictional anthropomorphic lion in this game that said something so genuine it messed with me. Like someone fished a thought from deep within my head and said, is this your card? And I just had to go for a walk. Like, ow! That hurt, game! And I know I'm not alone either. There have been many people who have had similar experiences with different parts of this game and how close it manages to hit home for an array of reasons. What I appreciated about this game was how it manages to focus on imperfections. The concept and execution of illustration and coloring it that scene within Chicory is messy, and I mean this in the best way possible, especially when you're given context for who and what the protagonist is within the story that we control. This little Pooch is not an artist, not by any conventional means that is, but we'll get back to this little nugget in a bit. When the story starts off, you're given a little bit of history about the brush in question, a little expositional stepping off point that makes you really quickly get up to speed on what this magical element is that binds this world together. In this case, the concept is color. The interesting thing about how this game structures this idea is that it's never hyper explained. In the world of fantasy story writing, you tend to have two weird ends of the spectrum in terms of how exposition is given within certain things that exist within the world that we find ourselves in. You can either have things not even remotely explained and we're just supposed to shrug it off and say, well, it's fantasy, I guess this is just the way things are going to be. Then you have the other side of the coin, where the author or writers themselves have decided to make sure that even the most crude layman could absolutely understand about all of the Fantastica elements work in excruciating details that it can be a little overbearing and seem to deject away from the core elements of what we were doing here in the first place. A typical good rule of thumb is to try to find a happy middle ground or potentially fluctuate back and forward depending on what's needed for the story in question. Some things do not need to be over explained, but some things probably do need just a little bit more elaboration and detail given to them. When it comes to the concept of the paintbrush, the audience understands that it's it's a magic item, but it doesn't do magic things. Wielding the brush does not make you a wizard. Heck, technically, anybody can use the brush. It's proven to us in the first couple of moments when you can interact with a character named Pickle, but I won't get into that. This works to the story's benefit because it doesn't deviate away from trying to explain how this thing works in hyper detail. No interdimensional mumbo jumbo or incantations. It's a brush. It allows you to paint things in the world in any color that you want. It's simple, and it gets right to the point. And a character that also manages to get right to the point is this little dog that we find ourselves walking alongside.
So, who exactly is this particular protagonist that I have yet to actually name drop even remotely ever since you started watching this video? Well, there's a reason why I haven't name dropped them at all, and that's because they're nameless. Now, I don't mean that literally. When you start off the game, you're asked a question about what your favorite food is. Whatever you supply in the text box will now be the name of the character. As for why it's food, well, this is the naming convention seen within the world of the Picnic Province. Everyone's name is based on food, it's fantastic, and it's adorable. Now, if you don't have a favorite food, or perhaps you can't think of it off the top of your head, there is an option to automatically fill in that option for you. The first option that pops up is the word pizza. For me, I've always known this particular painterly pup as pizza. It was the name I first heard when revolving around this character, and it was the name I used when I actually met the team at PAX West in 2019, and the demo build for the game I played for the first time. So rather than saying the protagonist for the remainder of this video, I will be referring to this protagonist as pizza. Characterizing a main character in a story is dependent on a number of things. How exactly you prioritize exposition, both in a diegetic and non-diegetic placement, the actual personality of the lead in question, and, by proxy, the characters that they interact with over the course of the story itself, or the role that that character plays in the story and world that they belong to. Something that has been present in storytelling for a very long time is using a character type that can be thought of as the implantive inquisitive. These are characters that get to ask questions to other characters within the story that don't feel forced for exposition, because usually they're characters that are brought into something with no history or context. Think Harry Potter himself. Poor kid has a zillion questions to ask with every book because this is a dude who lived in a cupboard under a staircase. Magic's a pretty step high up in that process. Thank heavens one of his close friends is a knowledge fanatic, eh? In the world of storytelling in the medium of video gaming, a different ring is folded into the mix of fabrics and thread for crafting a narrative that is unique to this space, the audience's ability to control the performers. While fairly straightforward, it has a number of things that story developers and writers have to take into consideration, the most notable being who exactly the main character is and what their connection is to both the story and the player. So in this regard, I have three notable options for how you can build a protagonist in a video game. It's not all of the potential options and variants that you can do, but I am boiling it down for the sake of easy processing. I've come up with metaphors that feel very appropriate for the subject in this game in question. Video game protagonists can be 1. A finished painting, 2. A half-painted canvas, or 3. An empty canvas. Finished painting characters are ones that aren't influenced by the player or audience in any way. Realistically speaking, the player is not controlling these characters, more like following along behind them as the story goes on. The player does not really make any variations in the narrative. The player isn't really guiding anything, they're witnessing the events with minimal input. Half-painted characters are ones that have little to substantial amounts of player-slash-audience influences. They still have a personality, and even aspirations and goals, but the player is able to implement their own choices as an outside observer that changes the outcome of specific events in the story, or potentially the outcome of the story as a whole. The player is guiding progression, but the character remains a separate entity with their own personality and mind. Empty canvas characters are, well, blank slates. They're not really characters by standard definition. They are, for all case and purposes, a suit that the player slash audience gets to wear to insert themselves into the story within the game. All of the choices that the character makes are actually the ones made by the player. The player is the character. Each one of these character types has their own unique advantages and disadvantages that are going to vary depending on the story that they are bound to. If you're going for a more cinematic experience, Finch's painting characters are going to be more traditional in feeling that still allow the players to have some control and feeling. The writers and developers of the games are primarily in control of the story and the characters, while empty canvas characters are going to be more to the benefit of delivering a emotional connection to the players by giving them the majority of the control over how things play out and how they are interacted with. So looping back around, what does this mean for the lead of Chicory, this food named hero by which we control throughout the adventures in this colorless world? Well, by the very nature of the game by which they hail from, pizza it most closely resembles a half-painted character. They have their own mind, their own history, and their own aspirations and hopes. We, as the audience slash player, get to make selective decisions and choices on their behalf, but not many of them actually change the outcome of the story threads or the story overall. We can control passive interactions, things that don't massively change narrative outcome. If you wanted, you could limit the amount of things that you color to only things that need to be colored for the sake of progression. You could not talk to any of the inhabitants in the world, reserved dialogue and conversation only to those who would actually advance the plot forward. You know, kind of like what happened at Awesome Games Done Quick this year.
here when Punchy beat the game in 33 minutes and 13 seconds, you know, just as an example. Because holy crap, this little pup's got places to be. Vice versa, you could talk with every single character and find out every last square inch that you can paint within the Picnic province. To help out the people who live there, as well as complete a sense of bringing something back to this world that makes it feel like it's whole again. Does it change anything? No, but it does give you a warm feeling inside that you got to know everybody and help everything out. Pizza sits in a happy medium, half and half. We get choices, but it also allows them to stand their ground and remain tall for what they believe in. The conversations they have with other characters in the story are still their own. Even if we are presented with a multiple choice option in terms of what response to give, we recognize that these options are still their voice saying it. They came up with these options. We simply get to choose which one, and in what order if given, it plays out as. We might control the direction the character walks, but we don't influence their personality. When Pizza finds the brush laying outside of Chicory's room, their choice to take it was to provide some assistance to someone that they look up to and respect. They don't think of themselves being the wielder at all. In their mind, they simply want to help correct a problem that they didn't know why it happened in the first place. This speaks to the half-and-half -half nature of Pizza's character, in that they're just trying to help and not be the next wielder the moment they laid their hands on the brush. In fact, the game does a wonderful subversion of expectation with this idea, right from the first chapter of the game, when we meet Chicory's predecessor of the brush, Blackberry. Just on their looks alone, we immediately get the sense that Blackberry means business. Her design consists of sharp edges and lines, her dialogue is thin and concise. She does not give a dang about being polite and gets right to the point. There's a sort of weighted grace with Blackberry's actions that comes to the forefront of her dialogue that makes you immediately understand what being the wielder means at least to this character. Up until this point, we've been of the mindset that being wielder was a bright and vibrant position to hold. You're literally giving color to the world with this brush, and Pizza's description of Chicory sounds like it was in the right hands. The brush is able to do spectacular things. I mean, we got a look of what happened in the storage room before the color wipe. We follow Blackberry into the supper woods, where we come across a giant corruption tree. Inside, Blackberry was waiting and informs Pizza that there's something else going on and demands to know why they have the brush and where Chicory was. Upon being taken by the corruption, Pizza barrels forward into the first boss fight of the game, an interesting concept of fighting a giant eyeball, or many giant eyeballs, by using the brush to fight back. After confronting the darkness deep within the tree, Blackberry goes on to talk down about Chicory, blaming her successor for passing the responsibility off to someone clearly unworthy of having the brush at all. Which, I mean... Ow. When Pizza comes clean about taking the brush without express permission, confronting these comments that Blackberry was saying about Chicory, Blackberry notes that the brush isn't something that anybody should use. There's a reason why there is a system of lineage, and we start to get a sense that being the wielder of the brush might not be everything we were told it was, and it becomes even more clear when we finally meet the titular character of the story, Chicory. There is a sensation that comes to every single person, especially those who work in a creative space, when they've got to a professional location that utilizes their skill set. Most people have heard of it, most people will experience it. It's a phenomenon known as imposter syndrome. Put very simplistically, it is a psychological process that works its way into the mindset of any individual who has managed to get to any point of success. And I mean quite literally any point of success. This weird underlying voice in the back of the individual's mind that poses the idea if they are indeed worthy of the success that they have risen to and received. This one singular mental inquiry breeds insecurity towards the fear that others will discover that this individual is not actually worthy of any praise, that any and all accomplishments that they've had have somehow been nothing but a giant fluke. All the steps they took to reach their highest point in their lives has just been coincidence. If you were to suddenly gain a large amount of success, you managed to don a title that used to belong to somebody else that you looked up to and respected. There's always going to be that little thing in the back of your brain that asks whether or not you actually deserve that title, or that lingering feeling that the moment you mess up, even slightly, you'll be stripped of your title and kicked out to the curb. How imposter syndrome manages to worm its way into the brain of the grand populace of creative people is deeply personal, and a lot of the time it happens because of our ability to compare what came before. Everywhere pizza goes in the entire of the Picnic province, they are constantly being shown the striking contrast of what they are currently doing with past wielders of the brush, making remarks that it isn't like it used to be or things were better way back when. Even when it's done with the most compassionate angle, there's no escaping the
from the reality that people will always use history as a light box to showcase the differences of what the most recent layer of changes are, and make the decision either to highlight their concurrence to these alterations or incite conflict in spite of those changes. This happens with everything throughout history. Even the most progressive and innovative changes are always going to be compared of what happened before it. To make matters even more stressful for a character like Pizza is the reality that they themselves are not an artist. But there is an important distinction that we need to make here and know about this element, how the past feeds the present to poison the future. If Pizza set their mind to it, they might become a very talented artist in this world, someone that they themselves believe is worthy of holding the brush, someone who could hold the title of wielder and wear it proudly. But this is another element of imposter syndrome that doesn't get showcased or discussed that often, this being the fear of becoming a fraud. This is exactly what it sounds like, the preemptive version of imposter syndrome that stops people from either taking the first steps towards achieving their goal or even considering it as an option. There are wildly talented people out there in the world today who never even take the chance to strive towards anything creative that they passionately feel about because they're afraid that any positive reception they might get would be false or misplaced or that they are predicting that their work will be exactly received how they dread. For pizza, it's a combination of never being able to live up to the same wide respect as any past wielders before them, as well as this sinking feeling that it's all just some twisted prank, that at any moment the brush will be taken away and Pizza will be exposed as the fool who fell for it. The dismay that you will never be good enough to other people, or that you'll never be as good as what came before, the fear of taking that first step towards achieving something because you're scared that it won't be well received, or live up to your own hopes and aspirations, venomous thoughts that slowly work their way into every corner of your mind draining the color from all your ideas, your ambitions, your dreams, leaving you either in a world lacking motivations to start or in a prison of your own mind that attempts to drown you in this cynical sea that shows nothing on the horizon. These are what toxic expectations are. What this game does is highlight the phenomenon of imposter syndrome and personalized toxic expectations in a way I've not seen many games or stories in general do as effectively or as, well, invasively as this game does. How many times this game managed to reach right down and pull out a moment of connectivity to the audience is insane. How everyone reacts to the expectations being presented and handled puts things into perspective of how anyone can take on the responsibilities that they're given. Sometimes it's out of honor or a title, other times it's out of love, compassion, and sometimes it's done out of desperation or perhaps out of a need to be something more. Structuring a character in a story to have an over overwhelming sense of responsibility towards something very specific is a very common trope. We as audiences understand that having a protagonist going through a series of trials, in this case it's quite literal but we'll get back to that, or shouldering an amount of truth that starts them off on their quest that they've been tasked with, or perhaps it's an internal conflict that slowly eats away at them as the adventure continues. It seems only natural, right? After all, main characters themselves have to have some sense of growth, right? Well, sometimes it's not so cut and dry. In this example, we understand that Pizza's journey is about amounting to something and becoming the person that they want to be. There's another wave of this journey that we don't often see. The mentality of being something or someone important and what that does to either those who never wanted it in the first place or perhaps those who aspired for it, only then to discover that it wasn't what they actually wanted at all. The way Pizza is officially given the brush from Chicory in Chapter 2 is an extremely layered scene to unpack. There's a lot of visual and contextual subject to take into consideration. When we find Chicory in her room, she's sitting on her bed in a lax fetal position and immediately tells us, the audience, that this person isn't doing well. We pick up on the body language and how her dialogue text is fairly muted and to the point. The moment Chicory was offered to take the brush back, there's a little moment of openness, both in a mental sense as she verbally supplies a supposition, while also sitting up more straight and literally opening up her body language, only then to snap back to being closed off again, saying that the brush was now officially pizzas to have. While we don't have any context or specifics, we know that this is someone who is going through something rather significant, if they're willing to just give something like this powerful item just away. Someone that we, the audience, have been told, namely through Pizza's own perspective, to be an amazing person capable of incredible things. And we aren't given much time to reflect about it before Pizza's earth-rumbling scream of overwhelming joy that they'll make Chicory proud takes command of the scene, which leaves most of the audience going, oh honey, read the room. The circumstance by which the brush was given away doesn't line up with the diabolically hyper-positive reaction our pooch gives. 
because Chicory isn't really giving the brush to someone, she's throwing it away. She doesn't want it anymore, and it doesn't matter who picked it up. After all the positive things our protagonist has said about Chicory, and even the characters around the Picnic Province who praise Chicory as a wielder of the magic brush, she doesn't seem to share that same opinion about themselves, constantly seeming to second-guess and criticize every action that they do, stating that something isn't right or apologizes for things being wrong or messy. It's here, both we as an audience as well as our protagonist begin to ask ourselves the heaviest question, why? What happened to this character that would cause them to willingly push off their title to someone else? Did something happen to them while they were the wielder? Are they not the person that Pizza made them out to be? Was this an example of the unreliable narrator trope in terms of Pizza leading the player to believe one thing when in fact it was something else entirely? Interestingly, it manages to be a combination of all of the above, while also tapping once more into the imposter syndrome phenomenon and toxic expectations. This time, however, it isn't about personal feelings one has about themselves. This is about learning what came before, knowing what a title means, what it carries, and who takes on that responsibility, and how it can shift your feelings and opinions, and even your own goals, all in the name of who or what came before you. The brush has a history that is slowly explained over the course of the story, but the main push comes from Pizza when they tackle their first official quest as the Wielder, being the corruption that is slowly overtaking the Wielder Temple, an old shrine of knowledge about the history of the brush and those who used to wield it. Along the trail towards the temple, Pizza ends up meeting Cardamom, the Wielder before and teacher of Blackberry. In stark contrast to Blackberry's sharp design and no-nonsense attitude, Cardamom is almost the polar opposite. He's a big lion with a friendly, smiling face. His Dialogue, invoking the feeling that he's soft-spoken and reserved. When Pizza converses with Cardamom, we learn that the corruption is something that actually happens throughout the Picnic Province and is not only common for the wielder to face, but at least in their lifetime, Cardamom admits that what's happening right now is the worst corruption he's ever seen. It's here that we learn that there's something deep underground that seems to rise to the surface, that only the brush can fend off, and that whatever this thing is, it's evil. Well, uh, probably, anyway. It's one of those duties that the wielder has to take care of and dispose of these corruptive growths before they get out of hand. This particular responsibility isn't something most folks actually know about for two main reasons. The first being that wielders don't want people to panic about this sinister thing that's always around and waiting to rise again. But the second element for keeping it a secret is because, well, no one knows how to explain it. It's hinted at several times, whatever this ancient evil is, it's not something that anyone seems to really understand what it is exactly or where it came from. It's just something that comes with the territory. The wielders pass down this information that the brush and only the brush can destroy the corruption before it gets out of hand, but no one seems to ask why it's there in the first place. This point and idea is actually something I'll return to a little later. After Pizza gets the information to open the pathway forward, they make their way towards the Wheeler Temple. Before they make it inside, however, Pizza gets a phone call from Chicory. Oh, yeah, I should probably mention that. There's actually a bunch of phone booths scattered all around the Picnic Province, and it's actually an accessibility thing. If you ever find yourself getting stuck or lost or unsure where exactly to go next, there's these phone booths that you can go up to and actually ring up your parents. First, you'll talk to your mom and she'll give you a vague idea of what to do, but if you want a more precise answer, uh, your dad takes over the phone and gives you a step-by-step -step instruction on how to get to the next part that you're heading towards. It's a really cute feature that is totally optional. She apologizes for acting the way she did before, and Pizza and Chicory have what can really be thought of as their first real conversation, where we discover that Chicory's resignation is solidified, and now she asks Pizza to continue wielding the brush, saying that she can't do it anymore. From receiving the brush from Chicory, leading all the way to the Wielder Temple does a multitude of things that we should examine in terms of storytelling, setting, structure, lore diving, and characterization. Right off the bat, allowing Pizza to be a type of character that holds somebody that they admire in such high regard allows us to understand what exactly they bring with their perspective to the table. It's made very clear that Pizza has an admiration for Chicory, and thinks very highly of her. But after meeting and briefly interacting with Chicory in a room, we understand that Pizza puts Chicory on a pedestal of their own wants and desires. They see Chicory as someone that they aspire to be someone who has their life figured out. When we meet the other people around luncheon who hold Chicory as high in regard as Pizza does, we start to think highly of Chicory as well. We meet a few others who preferred past wielders to Chicory, but we think of these people as people who probably just don't like change, so we don't take their thoughts into consideration. Then we meet Blackberry, and while it might just be that Blackberry is a prickly individual with high standards, we can't help but think, 
and process how much of what Blackberry could potentially be true. So now we start to think about Chicory in a slightly different tone. When we go back to the tower and try to give the brush back and we see this closed off restricted Chicory, the audience starts to question the information that we've been given. And just when we think we might have to sit with this information for a while, Pizza gets a phone call from the very person they've been thinking about. It is in this moment that helps push forward a sensation of connectivity between characters in a more, shall we say, honest interpretation in the modern age. It might be more difficult to explain to some, but there is something to be said about understanding how people interact with each other today versus how they would 20 years ago. More often than not, having difficulty when trying to connect with other people in a physical presence is a remarkably common sensation to have. We don't really take the time to reflect on how often we spend inside our own heads. That's why when you are faced with a problem that feels very personal, it's hard to open up about what's going on, because it's happening to you, and it can be hard to imagine anyone else going through something similar. Chicory being so cut off from communication and letting anyone else in is a result of believing that they are alone in their own issues. No one else could possibly know about the turbulence going on inside her head, so how could she let anyone else in? She's practically shut off from everyone by locking herself in a room. And even when there's someone in the room, she's not really looking at them for the majority of the time that they're there. It's only after some self-reflection that she realizes her actions, and rather than going to pizza in person, they wait for them to come in range of a phone booth and have a genuine conversation with someone who was not only their janitor earlier that day, but someone who gave her every opportunity to take back what they had. Pizza did not plead to keep the brush. They were willing to give it back mere seconds after entering Chicory's room in the tower. Chicory recognizes that this is someone who actually wants to help, and in this moment that barrier is brought down a little. Not all the way, but enough to open a dialogue. When Pizza begins to doubt their abilities, describing Chicory's art as bold, colorful, and strong, and questioning how they could ever even compare, Chicory reassures them that Pizza has this enthusiastic spark that Chicory just doesn't have, and that Pizza could be all the things that they want to be. And that little added detail of Pizza remaining on the line after Chicory hangs up is just such a wonderful little moment. And it's with this that Pizza makes their way inside the Wielder Temple. Inside the temple are a multitude of puzzles and hidden verbiage that help paint a picture I swear I'm not doing that intentionally. About what exactly the history of this world was. We learned that before the brush, there was nothing. No color to the world at all. As the world is now in its monotone saturation is how it once was. But it was from when the tree grew from deep below that with a branch taken by the first wielder, it had the ability to provide color to the world, created and channeled by one who held the brush. The temple itself presents a series of challenges to the new wielders as a means to give both a history lesson as well as provide a chance to hone their skills needed to start the journey of the wielder by challenging both the internal and external reflection and butts. Butts are also a part of this adventure too. No, I'm not going to explain that. It forms an understanding of what and how the brush is to this world as we can observe, which leads to this second element, which further seeds the weight and responsibility for antiquity. The Wielder Temple is, quite literally, a sanctum dedicated to the brush, what it stands for, what it did, what it does, and those who had the chance to use it. This isn't a magic brush, no, this is THE magic brush. You may have an idea of the importance donned by the title of Wielder, but it's only now that this thing rises to a whole new level of importance. You're not just handling something that's powerful, you're handling something that is ancient. Am I someone who happened upon the ownership of this thing, worthy of honing it in the first place? How on earth am I supposed to stand amongst these forerunners of creative expression, hold the name of Wielder amongst those whose actions shape the world as it is today? Surely I, I must be a fraud. I could never live up to the expectations and prospects of those who came before me, and even those who judge me now. But Interestingly, Pizza's perspective on this revelation does not come from them looking backwards in time, rather looking back at the last person who gave them this chance. The opinions of the long dead are not the problem. It's the eyes and the words of the living that weigh on the mind. The judgment of peers that rings loudest and stings to the very center of the mind. How could I possibly be like them? How could I be anything? Thank you.
utilizing a phobia in a story is something that most writers will do, sometimes with direct intentions and other times it's a more roundabout way to allow the audiences to draw their own conclusion of what's being alluded to through the story. Heck, sometimes the writer's fears and terrors indirectly impact the story and become an element unintentionally. This game does not shy away from tackling these hard-hitting subjects, so much so that inside the game settings and accessibility features, you can actually set up warnings to let the player know if they're about to enter areas, both in cutscenes and in gameplay, that are going to feature scenes of provocative circumstances that might be considered sensitive in topic or display. I'm going to be moving into spoiler territory for certain plot points seen within this game, namely how the protagonist and durotagonist, being Pizza and Chicory respectively, grow throughout the story and some key plot points to help showcase said growth. I highly encourage you to play this game for yourself before you continue. If you're in the mood for a watch along, I've got linked in the description of a playlist for when I joined my bud, Zero Kirby, on his live stream where he experienced the game for the first time with no context going into it. It's crazy, full of voices, and had us in tears with how hard we were laughing. Here's a sneak peek. What if I were to purchase fast food and disguise it as my own cooking? <laughs> you were gonna say it! <laughs> I knew you were gonna say it! <laughs> Delightfully devilish pizza. Oh, who oh. are you? Wait, hang on. <laughs> uh. <laughs> the child. <laughs> what happened to my apprentice's colors? Uh, you know, maybe we could have this- Oh. The Deku tree is dead. Yeah. Man. I am solid snake now. <laughs> <laughs> ah, a rat. Maybe the young books are doing all right after all. Why don't you take this? You got some trash. <laughs> <laughs> I am a great magician. Your clothes are red. How's the wielding going? <laughs> you winning, kiddo? The shoops are complex. There's a loot to thank about. <laughs> the gorp on the door beside <laughs> it. It's really, it's really interesting pizza. Oh well, my. <laughs> now that's what I call a <laughs> Nobody put any booze! Check it out. This is my party wiggle. It has your face. <laughs> Damn! Green. <laughs> Ooh. Paisa, we need to talk about your pantans. About my pants? Your pantans! My, my, my pants. Howdy! <laughs> the big brain moves are coming out. Ah, noon. Uh, I mean, I have to. <laughs> when it's so high noon, you gotta, you, you gotta say it's high noon-er. High noonest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, we got... Pumper oh no, it's Thanos. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> Does Licorice here kind of look like Shirley the Medium from Curse of Cowardly Dog? <laughs> You're still a terrible liar. <laughs> There's so much to unpack here. He's very sensitive about the size of his butt. It's my favorite PBS show. The bear with the big blue butt. <laughs> Ew, 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 ew. <laughs> yeah, that's weird and it's gross and I don't like it. <laughs> it's so intense pizza. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, the bandana! Oh! The only oh thing we need is an eye patch. Oh and this god. would be perfect. Oh I'd be big god. boss! Yeah. I I I hope I <gasps> I'm big boss now! <laughs> Boon Moses Island. <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk about privacy invasion and the reason I have a lock on my front door, Mom. Don't worry, I got a key made out of your key. Th That's not what I meant. That is not what I meant. Well, Mom. what if something goes wrong? What if your fire starts to spread and you're not around? It's not gonna do that. It's it, rec It's directly on the carpet, honey. But it's perfectly fine. Oh, no! Been working on this sandcastle all day. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to always feel like you nailed it. Uh, 
Uh, I do not like the fact uh, that somebody has been spying on me and put me in this video game. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Seriously, I recommend it. Additionally, it's at this point that I will also make this notation that we're going to be talking about conditions of psychological, neurological, and emotional distresses. Even though we're talking about a game filled with fun characters named after different kinds of food, we're going to be diving into some serious subject matter, so please keep that in mind before we progress. Okay? Here we go. Chicory, both as a game as well as the character themselves, ends up bringing to light the psychoanalysis of crafting a character with a divisive internal conflict. How the game presents Chicory, namely through Pizza's own internal thoughts and perspectives about her, leads you to believe one thing, when the actual implementation of Chicory into the narrative takes a hard turn in a different direction. Pizza, like many of the people in Luncheon, hold Chicory in extremely high regard, and most of them talk and think of her in a positive light. She is pedestaled as this beacon of creativity that seems to be unmatched, but unfortunately, Chicory does this to herself, just in the opposite direction. Now, there's nothing wrong with being proud of something that you've accomplished and being able to reflect on what you've done, but there is a ceiling to that reflection that ends up becoming unintentionally negative towards oneself and abilities. Chicory has a hard time feeling like she's done something correctly, always believing that what she's created could have been done better, or that the finished version that she has is wrong and she needs to do it again, starting over and over as many times as she can before she believes that she got it right or until she gives up in frustration. The worst part about this feeling is that it's extremely internal and hard for people to talk about. It's here that I want to take a moment to talk about a very specific type of storytelling element that's seen in the realm of video games and acts as a neat dive into etymology. In case you didn't know, there actually is a term for the study of games that goes by the name Ludoology and was coined by this man, Gonzalo Frasca, in 1999 as a part of the International Board Game Studies Association. A link to the article can be found in the description, where the term was based on the Latin word ludo, meaning to play. This is a means to study how we, as cultures, examine games that we play, be it with a ball or a racket, upon a board, or even in a video format. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because there's a very specific type of storytelling in video games themselves, known as ludo narrative, which, based off of what we just discussed a moment ago, essentially means a story within a game. Now, it is important to know that ludo narrative and narrative are two separate elements seen within video games. The typical idea of a narrative is what you'd see in most other forms of media. It is a story being told through a subject medium, words on a page, pictures in a comic or graphic novel, or visuals through a TV, cinema, or video gaming lens. Ludo narrative, however, is about the interaction with the audience through the medium that the story is taking place in. Interestingly, a lot of people have actually heard the word ludo narrative, but have heard it in a different context. If you follow any particular gaming channel or development cycles, you may have heard of the term ludo narrative dissonance, which is when a story of a video game does not match the actual gameplay set within the game itself. An example of ludonarrative dissonance would be controlling a video game protagonist who, during cutscenes, is very straight and narrow and openly states that they do not kill people, even if they are the bad guys. Once the cutscene ends, the player is now in control of this protagonist who picks up a rocket launcher and blows up a car full of bad guys. This is ludonarrative dissonance. This is a character who is one part in a game not controlled by the player who is saying and doing one thing, but during the actual playable sections they completely become something else entirely, almost doing the exact exact opposite of what they were describing themselves as. Okay, so why do I bring this turn up? What does Ludo Narrative have to do with Chicory A Colorful Tale? Well, it's actually kind of fascinating how the game manages to teach you about mental and creative standpoints of the protagonist that you're controlling, by putting it right under your nose, but never actually making a point to highlight it in a way that's obvious, and they do it in two very distinct areas. Right when the game begins, it's our first ever user-controlled gameplay sequence, where we meet Pizza inside of this maintenance closet cleaning up all of the art supplies, where we see this human humongous mural on the ground filled with all these spectacular colors and lining all the way from the middle of the floor to the walls. We see this collective colorful splatters and we make a mental note without meaning to, and it only comes into play when Pizza gets the brush and they only have four colors to choose from, a pastel collection of red, green, teal, and purple. This kind of selection of colors is actually a brilliant way of showcasing how little experience our little painterly pup has. Granted, we don't actually think of it like this. Most people would just attribute it as a 
game mechanic itself. However, as time goes on, it becomes more and more prominent to the player themselves that they start noticing that pizza's not capable of drawing smooth lines. You could have the smoothest hand on the planet when playing this game, but you'll notice that the lines that you draw with the brush aren't clean. They're actually quite sloppy and even have a slight wriggle to them, even after they've been laid down on a surface. The colors seen in the maintenance closet didn't do this, and we know from pizza that those colors that we saw back there are chicory's colors, so what gives? Why is the paint acting like this? It would be easy to make the assumption that this is just an aesthetic of the game itself. That doesn't actually carry any other meaning, and granted, that might be it, but I do think it helps to elaborate on an important distinction between the one currently holding the brush versus the one who gave it away, which actually leads back to what I was talking about originally, which also manages to be a second element to this Ludo narrative that I want to focus on. Near the start of Chapter 3, entitled Portraits of Chicory, Pizza returns to the Wheeler Tower to inform Chicory about the events that took place inside the temple, but they're taken aback by the sight of Chicory standing outside the tower next to an easel and painting tools. When Pizza inquires, Chicory notes that she's trying to paint something, but can't seem to get the right motivation for something to draw. Seeing the chance in front of them, Pizza offers themselves as a muse for Chicory to paint. Initially, Chicory agrees to this, but when Pizza suggests that they use the brush to paint, hesitation immediately sets right back in again. Again. and Pizza didn't mean to push that, they just wanted to see Chicory's colors again. And after a moment, Chicory accepts and takes the brush back, but only for a moment. She admits holding the brush feels weird, but she soldiers on. During this sequence, Chicory asks a series of questions to Pizza that the player can answer, relating to favorite color, the current feeling, as well as the color of Pizza's fur in the moment. While Chicory is painting, Pizza discusses with them that they wish that they were more like Chicory. Pizza cares too much about what everyone else thinks and doesn't know how to make choices, and they think themselves boring. But ever since they got the brush, they feel like they're somebody, and they want to be worthy of being somebody who has the brush, like Chicory was. Instead of taking the compliment, Chicory almost instantly shoots it down, calling herself a trash fire and that no one should look up to her. Ironically, Chicory would much rather be boring. After a moment's pause, Chicory says that the painting is done, but in order for them to see it, Pizza now has to draw Chicory in return. And this scene is just always so wonderful to see everyone's different interpretations of Chicory, different art styles, different colors, it's just wonderful. When the player has completed their work, Pizza and Chicory show off their works side by side, and we get to see the differences in style and skill. Now, you as the player might be creatively minded and have a steady hand. Heck, do what I do and play with a tablet monitor because... Butterfly. Plant. Tree. Plant. It's real! Yeah. But no matter how hard you try, you're still going to be wrestling with the brush and the canvas. It's never going to be exactly how you imagine it in your head. And that's just it. That's intentional. Think about who you're controlling. For all we know, Pizza might never have drawn a thing in their life up until this day. And now, they're holding one of the most valuable things in this world that is entirely based on drawing and creating things. The colors don't line up the way that you want them to. The color palette can range from a diverse collection of hues in one area to four different shades of bluish green somewhere else. During the art classes, and heck, even during this portrait exchange scene, you might be suddenly given a larger collection of colors, but it's not a wide array. Many of them are just different values and shades of the same color repeated across several different color wedges. When the two portraits show up side by side like this, it becomes very clear of the skills and experiences of one who trained for years and the one who literally started earlier that day. Now, understand, this is not a dig at pizza, nor at the player and their artistic abilities. This is simply a showcase of virtuosity of different stages. I know many creative people who look back on early works of their artistic adventures and noting how different things have changed in their own styles. What this game is doing is making you, the player, feel that by having to draw with pizza's hand. Uh, paw. I know it seems like such a simple thing, but this is the power of Ludo narrative when done correctly. You could have a world-class painter sit down and play chicory with all the best tools and all the best equipment, but they won't be able to do what they do normally, because in this world, that's not who you are. As trailers for this game have said in the past, this is a game about trying to be somebody you're not. 
Getting back to the portrait trade, not a few seconds after showing it, Chicory immediately begins to point out the elements that she sees as imperfections, claiming that she messed up on the colors and the line work. While some will refer to this as her being a perfectionist, there's a more accurate description that belongs to the sensation of a telephobia, which is the fear of imperfection. Perfectionism is wanting things to be perfect and striving it to make it so all of the time. The fear of imperfection, on the other hand, is the feeling that nothing you do will be perfect, more into the lines that everything you do will be wrong. I know many people in creative spaces that have this sensation that take part in their mind in some way, shape, or form. I think it comes with the territory, especially in the time frame that we live in, when everything we do creatively is always under this wide-scale lens and this horrifying internal microscope. I, for one, am terrified of making content. This isn't to say I don't love doing it, it's one of the things I enjoy the most, but there's always that part of my mind that puts things into perspective for me, whether I like it or not. It's tricky, it's stubborn, it's never really a part of you that goes away, at least not entirely. A lot of it comes down to the understanding of how much you yourself put into something that you care about. You really put effort into making this thing so that you can show it off to people and be proud of it. There's a great sensitivity that comes with this, and for the most part, there are many people in our lives that will never truly reach for the creative spaces because that voice in their head tells them that it won't be perfect. This game does something that, frankly, I've not seen many games, shows, movies, or even books do, which is to make that voice inside your head a part of the story. And no, I mean they literally make the internal critic an actual diegetic character that acts as the main antagonistic force in the story overall. And how it's done is honestly kind of brilliant, and don't worry, we'll get to that in a moment. After the exchange of portraits, Pizza and Chicory notice that gnarly black trees of corruption are now surrounding the Wielder Tower. Noting the severity of the situation, Chicory asks if Pizza is still willing to face this. Pizza wants to show that they can handle this and make Chicory proud, to which Chicory points Pizza in the direction of Gulp Swamp, where the nearest corruption is located. On their way there, Pizza runs into Blackberry, doing their own investigation of what's happening. It's here that we get some exposition of Blackberry's harshness towards Chicory, and how it's out of necessity, bringing up that the corruption that Pizza is now dealing with was, and should still be, Chicory's responsibility to handle. And to casually bash their former student about how bad of a job they did, and how the whole world being in peril is actually because of their inability to do what they signed up to do. Oh my god, Blackberry, are you made of salt? Take an Alka-Seltzer and go lay down, you mean old woman. Jeez. After a series of puzzles throughout the swamp, Pizza makes their way inside of the corruption tree. After they get inside, the corruption starts slashing back to previous bosses that Pizza had encountered in Supper Woods and in the Wielder Temple, but things take a weird turn when all these horrifying creatures suddenly compress together and there's Chicory standing in front of Pizza. And what does this shadow chicory do? Immediately starts talking about Pizza having the brush is a terrible idea and that Pizza should be erased. Now, we can understand that this is not actually chicory, but still, imagine that for a moment. The reflection of someone that you admire and look up to appears before you and starts to tell you that your actions towards something are wrong. The person that gave you the chance to be somebody important in your own eyes is telling you that the act of giving you that chance was the biggest mistake they've ever made. After defeating this shadow chicory, Pizza speaks with Blackberry shortly after, informing her of what they saw inside the tree. Blackberry makes the assessment that the corruption appears to be connected to Chicory in some way, and because of their history, they can't go and speak to her about it, but Pizza still could. Once they return to the tower, Pizza informs them both what happened inside the tree and Blackberry's comments on the matter. Not seconds after hearing this news, the corruption begins to slowly emerge from beneath Chicory and engulf the room. Chicory finally breaks. They start talking about how they're a messed up person. These corruptions aren't connected to her, they're coming from her. Everything is messed up and it's because of her and she doesn't know what to do. Pizza asks Chicory to deny what the corruption said. That couldn't possibly be how Chicory felt, right? Chicory actually believes that Pizza could be something. She doesn't think Pizza having the brush is a mistake, right? When Chicory wants to be left alone without answering any of these questions, Pizza snaps in retaliation. Pizza was doing all of this to help Chicory. Pizza only wanted to be her friend. Pizza can't believe that they looked up to somebody like Chicory. In the pregnant pause that followed, there's a moment of remorse that Pizza feels for letting that last line fly. But before being able to talk about it, they're cast out of Chicory's room, now sat on the floor in the foyer of the Wheeler Tower in silence. 
Ponder how that would feel, truly. How that would melt you down to your core and bring forth any and all insecurities you would have about something that you've done or have done up until this point. This cuts deep. But it stings even more when you ask the real person for clarification, a chance to contradict what this doppelganger said wasn't true. But they don't even argue. They just reaffirm that they are a messed up person as they thought they were. When both the figment of your peers and your actual peers are saying the one thing you dread hearing as somebody who doesn't feel like they belong? Jeez, this story is playing dirty. But then it starts to fling mud at the end of chapter 4. Pizza finds themselves inside the Grub Caverns, home of the bugs, where inside of the corruption tree in these depths they come to face themselves. The corruption has now become a doppelganger of Pizza and is throwing out verbal punches with no gloves on, questioning Pizza's own motives, saying that everything they're doing isn't actually worth anything, that they're pretending to be the wielder because they just want to feel important, asking if Pizza even believes that they should be holding the brush at all. This is what I mean. They've turned an internal conflict and made it an external conflict. That's not something that happens often, story people, and even when it does pop up in other mediums, it does not pack the brass knuckled punch like this does. That negativity that rests in your mind is one thing. Imagine if it had a body of its own and it quite literally begins to throw hands. What do you even do in this situation? Even in the battle itself, whenever Shadow Pizza gets hit by one of your own attacks, they let out a painful yell. The same yelp that's let out if pizza falls in battle with the other bosses in the game. It is in these moments that we need to recognize something important. We might feel alone in our internal struggles, but even if the weight of these immense responsibilities, the structure of our insecurities, or the mental battle that we face that stops us from wanting to step up and be something with ourselves, we are not alone. And sometimes, it's in the most unexpected places and people who can show you just how much these things connect us to one another. For Chicory as a character, and perhaps in the larger scale of things, the wielder as a whole, this is both an internal and external focus point. There's this fear that she has that if she's not constantly focusing on making herself better and the most perfect version of herself, she's unworthy of the title that she's earned at this point in her life. She knows exactly what she wants to do and how to do it, so much so that she will stand in one spot, desperately paint the same square inch in the most perfect state that she will stand there for hours and hours hours, trying over and over again until she flat out cannot take it anymore and gives up in frustration. The critic inside her head is constantly making her feel like she's not good enough. We then compare this to somebody like Pizza, somebody who has no idea what they want to do with themselves, that simply holding a broom and cleaning a spot on the ground is satisfactory to them, because in their eyes they did something worthwhile. What happens when you give this person an extraordinary power of a magic paintbrush to help color in the world, and what you get is a shock shockingly honest take of how things can be perceived. We're not looking at somebody who is classically trained, who had been taught ever since they were little how to properly manage and create things. We're looking at somebody who has little to no experience in this field, bringing only what they have to the table. They don't do this as a means to boost their ego. They do it out of the intention of wanting to be helpful, because even when they are properly handled the title of wielder, it still feels foreign to them, almost as if it's never actually something they were able to hold at all. The critic inside their head is constantly making them feel like they aren't good enough. Within story development, writers and developers will often implement a specific type of character, known as a foil, the definition being, quote, a character who contrasts another character, typically someone who contrasts a protagonist, in order to better highlight or differentiate certain qualities of the protagonist. More often than not, foil characters are usually one of three variations, a companion slash friend of the main character, the deuteragonist, being somebody whose importance to the story is second to the protagonist, or the antagonist. This isn't to say these are the only versions, 
but the most common, examples being Harry Potter and his rival Draco Malfoy, Romeo and his friend Mercutio, Dr. Jekyll and his twisted alter ego Mr. Hyde, and the detective partners of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John Watson. What's interesting about these particular examples is that all of them are a different kind of foils with a different purpose, ranging from enemies to friends, the same person to work partners. Foils are there to show another side of the coin, a means to prove how much of a character is what they are as the protagonist. We might see Harry as our hero, but when compared to Malfoy, he's practically a saint. John Watson is your everyman that allows the mind of Sherlock Holmes to be elevated to new heights. That is, well, the inside of his head is called a mind palace, and I think that says enough. So, how does this relate to Chicory? Well, it comes down to understanding how foil characters are used in contrast. Not all of the elements used with a foil character are meant to be extreme, as any particular type of element from one character to another is just a means to showcase how different another character is from the other. Foil characters that look to one another as a means of comparing the features and trait of one another are what makes these sorts of pairings endearing. Both Chicory and Pizza, within the story as it's presented to them, are going through monumental ups and downs. Many different kinds of stories that use foil Foil characters will use this as a means to test the friendship, or at least what the connection is between these two characters, and how it is sometimes put into conflict, or at least into balance. But the difference here is how it actually takes place through the story overall. It's one thing to have characters befriend one another in a story, it's another to actually spend time with these characters in a way that makes their friendship feel natural. And that's something that Chicory A Colorful Tale manages to do right. It makes the connection feel like it has legs to stand on and walk with, rather than a friendship that's forced out of necessity for the plot. We have witnessed hundreds upon hundreds of stories like this. Does this sound familiar? Two characters that don't really like or tolerate one another have to work together to achieve a goal, only to have a friendship slowly bloom over time. Then the friendship gets challenged with an unveiling of true intentions, or the big lie is revealed and the characters have an abrasive interaction and go their separate ways. This usually happens at the end of the second act of stories that feature it, which is why it most commonly is referred to as the second act breakup in most iterations, only to have these characters realize that they are really friends, they meet up again for the climactic apex, and the two of them end the story as newly formed friends. I'm looking at you, Disney Pixar. You've gotten better at it over time, but holy moly, you really liked using this trope back to back. Does this kind of plot structure have purpose? Sure, those elements are used as a means to showcase the connection between characters in question and how they can be faced with a hardship and still have a newfound friendship and connect at the end. This is a plot structure that does work, but as with most things when it comes trends and tropes, it's been done countless times, and it becomes stale after so many iterations with only slight changes between them. What we can do is compare this to what happens in this game. This how do we call it? Companion Catastrophe! As I described before, with Chicory admitting to the corruption being from her, and Pizza questioning their connection at all, it takes place right around Chapter 4, putting their clash closer to the 30-ish, 40-ish mark of the story. While this chapter showcases the battle of Shadow Pizza, it's in Chapter 5, entitled The Source, where we actually see a resolution in the form of absolution. Upon finding the roots of the corruptions were not literally the roots of the trees, the focus is then pointed back at Chicory. Pizza makes their way back to the Wilder Tower once more. Pizza tries to call out to Chicory through the door, but there's no response, but the door is unlocked, so Pizza makes their way inside. Chicory's room has now taken on a completely different shape, mirroring what we see inside of the corruption trees. It's here that we actually see that Chicory took the time to hang the portrait that Pizza painted of them, a detail that was not present before the abrasive argument. This was something Chicory did afterward. When we find Chicory, she's standing in a void. No sounds, no objects, just Chicory alone. Pizza tries to warn Chicory that staying in this tower isn't safe, that something is seriously wrong. Chicory snaps. She's what's wrong. Everything that is happening is her fault, and she can't stop herself from placing all the blame on her own shoulders. She's broken. She's messed up. She should just be left behind and forgotten about. Pizza tries to speak up about what they saw in the Greb Caverns, but it doesn't help. Chicory is consumed by her own self-doubts. This time, Pizza isn't battling an amalgamation. This time, the person on the other side of the ring is the actual person that they've admired from the start. But this isn't a fight. This boss encounter is a conversation. 
and I mean that both literally and metaphorically. This boss battle shows Chicory throwing everything in the kitchen sink at Pizza to get them to leave, but at no point does Pizza ever strike back. Even if the player paints the entirety of the screen, nothing ever lands. It is in this moment that Pizza actually takes control of the action. Once again, we're presented with two concepts that we talked about earlier, Pizza being a half-painted character, and that we control them for the majority of the story. This is an instance where they are taking control of the intent which plays hand in hand with the examples of Ludo narrative on display. Pizza is not here to hurt Chicory. They want to help them, even if that means that they get hurt in the process. Every time Chicory pops out of these piles of color, Pizza tries to tell Chicory that this corruption isn't her fault. This thing is looking and sounding like Pizza. It must be something else. But with every point that Pizza tosses, Chicory swats it away, telling them to stop making excuses on her behalf. She claims that Pizza is a better wielder. She doesn't know why she'd ever regret giving Pizza the brush. It's just one of the many regrets things and thoughts that constantly attack at her mind. Chicory pleads that Pizza should just abandon her, that this world would be better off just forgetting that she was ever the wielder at all. And after waves of attacks and crashes of Chicory saying that everything was coming from her, Pizza snaps, screaming that they don't care where the corruption is coming from. They can't face this alone. They're not going to abandon Chicory in this horrible place. They're not going anywhere. In this moment, amidst all the thunderous chaos on both inside Inside and outside, Pizza is here for Chicory. She just needs to breathe. The void fades away. Chicory and Pizza now sat outside the tower, and after a moment, the epiphany sets in. If the corruption is coming from both Pizza and Chicory, using their fears against them, it must be coming from something that they have in common. It must be coming from the brush itself. As the game has progressed till this point, the bond with the brush has increased with every defeat of each boss, and Chicory notes that when she had the brush, she felt this bond. It's what allow her to color and shape ideas, make thoughts real. Perhaps this brush was reaching even deeper into whoever held it. If the brush is able to make the wildest dreams of the wielder become real, what could it do with your worst nightmares? Chicory apologizes to Pizza once more for forcing them to deal with all of this. That version of herself that showed up in Gulp Swamp is not the person she wants to be. A reminder of every mistake she's made. Pizza wishes that they could help Chicory with their own self-perception. Moreover, they wish that they could just be friends. Chicory assumed that Pizza would have hated them by now, and Pizza echoes that they thought Chicory hated them. There's a moment of reflection. Chicory commits to being Pizza's teacher and help them become a true wielder. As much as they realize that bonding with a brush might make things worse, it's the only thing that can stunt the corruption. The guidance of Chicory Pizza now travels to each corner of Picnic as a means to test themselves against the wielder trials. A series of challenges that will lead them to the highest peak or into the vastness of the oceans. This particular type of contrasting element is relevant in terms of characters like Pizza and Chicory and how both of them view themselves in a negative light and how they compare themselves to other people and things. Pizza holds Chicory on a pedestal and praises their actions while looking down on themselves for not knowing what they want to do. Chicory looks at Pizza and yearns for that level of confidence that they carry, believing that nothing they do will ever live up to the hopes and aspirations of the people who need her. Both view the other as the superior, simultaneously poisoning themselves with their own expectancies that they have for their own progressions. The friendship they form feels genuine. The conversation that happened just between the two of them results in interpersonal and heavy dialogue. We witness their friendship blossom from acquaintances by trade, to mentor and pupil, to confidants facing off against an unknown threat side by side. These aren't characters that are partnering up for the sake of the quest. They genuinely want to be around each other, boost each other up. We witness barriers coming down between these two individuals individuals that, if everything went according to plan originally, might never have had the chance to learn about one another, being nothing more than acquaintances at best. It's refreshing to see this overshadowed development of connections between people. We get to see how things grow, how things change. It is in the nature of things to evolve, unless... However, that prosperity is deliberately stunted by wanting to keep things the same because that's what's supposed to be. What happens when heritage gets in the way of change? What defines traditions? What gives inherited ideals their power? Is it the convention set down in writing of what happened long ago? Or is it the last iteration of what was bestowed onto the next holder of that title? 
Do we hold the values of who came before us because we honor their choices, or do we hold them because we're told that we have to? While we get a brief introduction of the concept of the wielder and the brush at the start of the game, and a more visual thread is shown inside the wielder temple, the finer details are left hazy because, well, our protagonist doesn't know about these things. For them, the brush and the wielder have always been out of reach and comprehension. They can understand why something's there and why it's important, but that doesn't mean they truly grasp what it is and why it's there. It's when they start their mentorship under Chicory that few more details become revealed, both about Chicory as a person as well as the steps taken to become a wielder, aptly done through the wielder trials, reaching from the highs and lows of luncheon, whether they be out at sea or on a mountaintop. What we learn through these trials are about the foundations that were set into motion by predecessors, both those who wield the brush as well as those who honor its importance to the world that it belonged to and served. This goes back to what I was mentioning earlier about the brush being ancient. We learn that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of wielders of the brush before pizza and chicory and blackberry and cardamom, each with their own unique style and takes on the creative process and their interpretations of what the wielder means. It's revealed by cardamom that there are a lot of things about being a wielder that go unknown by the rest of the world, namely the enormous amount of stress and pressure that comes with handling a title as important as this. We don't spend a lot of time around cardamom, but from the little nuggets we do get, we learn that cardamom was an example of someone who held the wielder title for far longer than they wanted to, and in some aspects, should have. What does it mean to give someone responsibility? What does it take to earn the ability to give it to someone else? What does it take to earn the ability to receive said responsibility? For the wielders of the brush, it's an artistic inclination, as well as time devoted to training and learning from the current wielder of the brush, so that it can be passed on as it's thought to be properly. Cardamom and Blackberry are two very interesting characters that we only scratch the surface of when it comes to their history leading up to and being the wielder. While someone like Pizza uses their limited knowledge of the history of the brush, as well as their admiration of chicory, to bolster the status and importance of wielders, Cardamom and Blackberry were classically trained to be the wielder by learning from the predecessors. This interestingly becomes another instance of foil characters, except this time it's about two side characters being compared to one another. Cardamom's story is a bittersweet tale because of his feelings towards the status of the brush. His time with it tainted the responsibility and how the world placed so much of said responsibilities on the wielder shoulders. To boil down what we learn from Cardamom, he is an example of someone whose pastime became their occupation, and that alone smothered the enjoyment of his time with the brush. To the creatives in the audience, I ask you this. How many times have you heard somebody say the phrase, find a job you love doing, and that we should use the talents of the job you find yourself in. To most people, these phrases make sense, right? People want to be able to enjoy things inside of their occupations, otherwise they'd be miserable in what they do. But that statement is different for artists and creative people, because it's not as simple as just using our skills and talents in a job. Ask yourself this, would you still love writing if you had to do it every single day about writing about things that you're not interested in? Would you find entertainment entertainment in drawing your own ideas if you spent the entire day drawing out the ideas of others? What most people outside of these creative spaces don't realize is this ability to make art and create things is not a perpetual machine that can be toggled on and off at the flip of a switch. Just because you can draw, does that mean that you should, given the status of head artist on a motion picture? Just because you can write, does that mean that you should be the head writer of a hit TV show? It's not an easy answer because it's not an easy question, namely because the circumstances are why dependent on the individual in question. As many times in my life I've heard someone say, choose a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life, is equal to, if not lesser, than the amount of times people have said the phrase, never let your hobby become your job. Cardamom is the living example of the latter. This was someone who became the wielder less out of responsibility and more out of an interest of this particular aspect of it. He loves to draw. Once he started his duties as the wielder, it became evident that this isn't anything like it was cracked up to be. In his his own words, he was no longer drawing for himself. He was drawing for everyone else, and that killed a lot of the positive feelings he had for drawing. How he was doing it day in and day out as a part of the responsibility to the world was an enormous weight to bear on his shoulders. To make matters worse, Cardamon tells us that he wanted to quit being the wielder a lot sooner than he did, but the reason why he didn't was because he felt the responsibility. It was chained to him, and he couldn't find anyone else who could take the job seriously as needed. 
There is a running joke within a community that I'm a part of that Blackberry arrived as Cardamom's protege. Cardamom did the bare minimum effort training and just gave the brush to Blackberry and bounced. Now Cardamom lives way on the outskirts of a town deep in the foothills where he isn't bothered by the weight or responsibilities of anyone. That's heartbreaking. To have someone get a job in something they felt so passionately about only to find out that it's the opposite of what they thought, but it's physically, mentally, and emotionally draining in such a way that it just smothers the joy and want to further any kinds of passions around or related to this thing that they love doing in the first place. I mean, hey, creative people, does that sound familiar? Then you have Blackberry, Chicory's former teacher, whose story is one of great success. Her reign of wielder was many, many, many years long. This was somebody who wanted to ensure that the next wielder was worthy of the title, someone who could properly continue what Blackberry was doing. I'm sure we've all known somebody in our lives who was insanely strict in terms of instruction, be it a teacher, a coach, heck, even a family member. Most people who have an unyielding code for how something is done might have a multitude of reasons for why they keep this code. They could argue that this is what gets results, or perhaps they were taught this way by their teacher, and they're simply mirroring what they were taught before. Once again, talking about the continuation of upholding legacies because it's tradition. With Blackberry, it's complicated because we're never given the full story of who they were before, heck, even during the time frame of their ownership of the brush. We get that she's strict and precise, but we don't really know what the events are that caused Blackberry to be so stern and calculated as they are. The colors that she would have painted with are long gone, even before the color wipe incident that starts the game. We have nothing to use as comparison other than anecdotes from other patrons in Picnic. It's made clear that Blackberry and Chicory had some sort of fallout, but it's only when we travel to Brunch Canyon where we find out what this is. The trial inside of Brunch Canyon was Chicory's last trial before she was supposed to be officially deemed as wielder, only to have Blackberry suddenly change her mind and try to forcibly take the brush away from Chicory. Once Pizza enters the corruption tree in that canyon, we see a faint retelling of the events. This time, it's through Blackberry's eyes. What caused this rift between these two people? Was it Blackberry's own ideals? Her own expectations? Did she pick Chicory because she saw herself? Is that what she wanted? Blackberry 2.0? Is it fair to push these ideals onto another creative person? To want them to be the mirror image of what they were replacing? How do you expect anyone to be their own artist if they're expected to make the exact same brushstrokes as you did? Doesn't that stunt the ability for someone to be unique? To have their own style? To be creative? That's what's so tricky about these conventions set into place by the events of history. There's this notion that these things, because they existed in the past, these things should remain the same and shouldn't change, or even be questioned. It's a noticeable plot point nearing the end of the story of what happens if those conventions are challenged, if the systematic cycle should be broken because of the negative things that happen under the surface, even if the system works and has worked for a very long time. Frankly, this is insane to think about how a game about coloring a blank world back in and inhabited with cute animal creatures would be able to showcase and provoke these kinds of thoughts with an audience. Normally, when you have a story that's going to talk about heavy subject matter, they usually try to find a way to weave it into the narrative so that it has direct impact with the characters and their progression, but that's not the case here. Most of these elements are dictated to characters off to the side of the main story. Sometimes even dialogue exchanges go completely missed if the player doesn't take the chance to talk to a character for a second time, so you can find new details to potentially find a deeper meaning. It's not rare to find games that hide lore in the creases of the world that the player can find but it's interesting how the most simple dialogue exchanges can reveal a lot about someone that you normally wouldn't think twice about in terms of their history in this world. Pizza's adrift self-image, Chicory's internal self-doubts, Blackberry's obsessive control, Cardamom's tainted advocations, the world's expectancies of what the wielder should be, could be, and is supposed to be. All these things are about people whose expectancies, be it for themselves or those around them, or those who will take their place, or even the image of what they believe a person to be in their own point of view, have become a contamination of belittlement, intentionally or not. We forget the lives of these people are happening when we're not looking. Just because we leave the scene doesn't mean their story stops. It just is the shifting of the lens to focus and follow a different pathway. We're all moving in all sorts of directions. Everyone's got a past that they walked from, a present that they stand in, and a future they're moving towards. We don't all have the same origin, or the same number of steps, or the roads that we walked on, but we all came from somewhere, and are going somewhere else. Whatever came before you is behind you. You can use it as guidance, as a reminder, or never look back on it at all. It doesn't change the fact that it's there. 
how much of it you take with you is up to you. How can we learn from Chicory as story writers and developers? Well, I mainly wanted to make a video about Chicory, a colorful tale, to really emphasize on a few highlighting aspects of how you can create a story that tackles heavy, hitting subject matter, without being forced or feeling intentionally meta, that it might detract from the message you were trying to send. It's quite shocking about the amount of writers and story developers who have a fear of tackling their own personal projects because of the subject matter inside the stories, going into territories that we're scared to tackle because of how confident confidential it can feel to us. It's no easy feat to want to write about something that you are personally connected to, but you'll always fear getting started or finishing that idea because it might not click with a grander audience. Sure, there might be a handful or even a group of people who enjoy it and connect with it, but what if someone doesn't like it? What if a few people don't like it? What if a bunch of people don't like it? What if no one likes it? What if everyone just hates it? Breathe. It's okay. Wanting to talk about something that is so unbearably personal to you is what makes you a human being. You feel so passionately about making this thing into a reality that it consumes all of your waking thoughts and similarly, your fears about making this thing plagued by the possibility of it not reaching the perfection that you imagined in your head. The fear that it might be disliked or even despised by those who see it. I have this fear. It's with me when I wake up in the morning. It lingers with me every bit of productivity that I do with my job or my hobbies. It lays with me as I return to bed each night. What I don't let it do is control me. I use it as a chance of reflection to help guide myself, make something I can look back on and be proud of. Even if it becomes dated or I might look back on it and have changed my own perspective, I can still look at it and say, I made this and be glad that I did. Most importantly, I'm glad that I tried. Even if it might not be the way I envisioned it in my head, even if in a day or week, a month, or even years down the line, I look back on it and wish I did something different, at least I sat down and got what was once in my head out. We as story writers and developers and storytellers should take away how this story presents itself and the characters bound within, and how at the root of it all, we are all vulnerable. Creative people are capable of remarkable things that transcend time and leave impact on the grander scale of people, historically and in societies. While we can use what we have in our own history to guide us forward into the future, these rules and expectations should not be things that limit us. They should not be things that hold us down from achieving new heights, walking down different paths, and potentially experiencing new outlooks on how we as creatives can strive towards something different. It's no surprise that for creatively inclined people who have played Chicory, A Colorful Tale, that this game resonates with us in a way that's hard to explain, especially those whose livelihoods aren't bound to the arts like ours are. But that fear of not getting something right, that things you make won't amount to something, or that you won't or even should be compared to those who come before you, once more I say, you are not alone. We've gone through tough times recently, many of us forever changed by the shifting ties of what's washed ashore, hoping that things will right themselves back to how things should be. But like getting hit by a tidal wave, there's no going back. You might have experienced a rush of joyous adrenaline, or maybe you got knocked down, tossed about, and learned a valuable lesson. Creating things and attempting artistic ventures is the same. There is no guarantee that what happens will work in the long haul, or that success will be an immediate spike or a journey that takes weeks, months, years to achieve that pinnacle of triumph that you feel you need. So give it a go. Workshop that idea that you've been meaning to get started. Find that character that's been resting deep within your mind's eye. Start working on that illustration that's been bouncing around in your brain and has been itching to get to a canvas. Start typing out those thoughts about a world that you want to create. It's okay to be fearful of starting a new adventure, regardless of if it's your first time around or the hundredth time. You don't make a cake simply by putting the ingredients in the same room. You gotta figure it out, whether it be by following instructions or charting your own course and making it up as you go. It doesn't need to be perfect. It's just the beginning. It'll look small from where you're starting out. You might have many eyes on you and what you make. We're all just making this up as we go. It is through our own trials that we learn that we might slip, we might trip, it might crumble, and we'll stumble. We might succeed, 
we might fail. So you know what? All that's left to do is try. Thank you for watching this episode of Story Surgery. <laughs> uh, I've been wanting to talk about this game for so long. Uh, for like a solid year, I just did nothing but doodle constantly regarding Chicory a Colorful Tale. Like, I have an entire Twitter thread just dedicated to it. Oh man, there has not been a video game that has done this much of an overwhelming job that I wanted to dedicate an entire video talking about all the different facets of what it does and how we can just examine it and learn from it and just experience and enjoy what this does. My goodness, it's so cool. For me, the first real exposure for it is when I actually got to sit down and play the demo build at PAX 2019, and hilariously, less than, what was it, like two months later, it got folded into the collection of games published by Finji, which are the people who did games like Night in the Woods, Wilmont's Warehouse, and the most recent game, Tunic. But my goodness, just the amount of things that this does for those in the creative spaces is truly, wonderfully overwhelming in the best possible way. I said it before, I'll say it again. There have been so many people I've seen play this game and just have so many different visceral reactions to something that this game does or a character says or how it handles certain subject matters and whatnot that it causes people to just full stop go, okay, I don't like that this game is like poking at a very specific part of my brain. Ow. Heck, it did that to me several times. I want to thank the wonderful Zero Kirby for allowing me to use all of the footage used during the live streams that we did playing Chicory A Colorful Tale. A link in the description is going to be directed towards all of that footage, so that way, in case you want to actually see the absolute insanity that happened when the two of us sat down to play that game, it's, it's an adventure. It's one of those things where it really goes to show how long we've known each other. You you really find out how much of a giggly person we are, especially when we're just volleying ideas and phrases back and forth. There's a bunch of completely nonsensical stuff that happens there, but I absolutely recommend it. So yes, down in the description, several hours of just non-stop two dudes just dorking around. I also want to thank the two collaborators of this video. Yes, Lunar Doggy and Ice Wolf. These two dudes are so cool. I'm so happy that I was able to get them on board with this. It was so cool being able to watch the process of how they work on their illustrations and their animations, being able to talk about all that, just a constant back and forth. It was just so overwhelmingly awesome to see, like, that process happen and I I I'm just so tickled pink that that's a that's a thing that I'm capable of doing is being able to get some people on board uh, to do what they like and showcase what they love and that's it's a big deal. Both of their profiles are linked down in the description so please check them out and see all the things that they've been doing and working on because yes yay <laughs> I don't have a way to end this section I'm just really I'm so happy that this is a thing that was able to happen. I want to thank every single one of you for patiently waiting for Story Surgery to get back up on the tracks again. It has been a chaotic couple of months, and even when it comes to making this video, it took a little longer than expected just because the world's gone weird, but it's it's a it's a step-by-step -step process. So we're we're working with what we've got and as long as we're able to keep moving forward, that's always a positive. So again, thank you all so very, very much from the bottom of my story-driven heart for watching this episode all the way through, making it all the way here, and supporting the channel in the way that you have. The next video that's going to be showcasing on this channel is going to be a video talking about the Klonoa series. That also has been in my head for a very long time, although that one a little bit longer because I am a long-standing fan of that series. I'm doing my very best to get it out before the release of Fantasy Riviere that's going to be happening on July 8th of 2022. So look out for that video. And yeah, thank you all so very much for watching this episode of Story Surgery. My name is EPC379, and I'll see you for the next operation. <laughs>